titles will be, but it may be the same thing going forward. Uh, and we're really happy to have a good crowd of people here, including uh, some of our uh, administrative help at Erlanger, as well as f uh, physicians and workers from multiple different departments. Uh, I want to introduce two people before I introduce our speaker uh, that we're going to actually rely on them to maybe make some comment later. Uh, Dr. Tika and Brent Eastman, if y'all just raise your hand there. Uh, they're, they're here uh, celebrating our graduation activities and Dr. Brent Eastman is going to give them the 28th uh, McCravey lecture tomorrow and for those of you that have, don't already know about it, uh, we welcome, welcome you to come and we're happy to have you here at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, and uh, they have some uh, unique experiences uh, with women in medicine themselves and we may have them make a few comments after our presentation. Uh, we, we are really uh, pleased to have uh, a, a member of our local community here uh, to give this talk this morning. Uh, Linda Moss Mines, who uh, this is her picture that's on the wall in the, in the reception area of the hospital. Uh, she's not in that uh, dress today. Uh, but I wanted you to know a few things about her because people that give these sort of lectures are almost always special and she is extremely so and has a life uh, that's obviously been dedicated to not just history but to education and these are some of the things that you should know about her. Uh, since 2006 and 2008, respectively, she's been the, uh, historic, the historian for Chattanooga and Hamilton County, for example. Uh, she was the 20 plus year uh, chairman of the History and Social Sciences Department at uh, Girls Preparatory School. Uh, Dr. Ha our, our Governor Haslam has appointed her to the Tennessee Historical Commission. Uh, she's a leader in the Chief John Ross uh, Daughters of the American Revolution a chapter here that's very active. And I was very impressed that she's a past president for Habitat for Humanity, so she, she does a lot of things other than just record history and study it. Uh, she's on multiple education committees, as you see there, um, and then she's received awards for, for her lifetime of service, including uh, the Tennessee Fellow, this is statewide Tennessee Fellow Teaching Award in 2015. Same thing for the Hubert Smothers Award and then the local Living Good Award uh, last year here. So those are outstanding accomplishments that she has. And she's on multiple, multiple boards here in Chattanooga. But for us here in this room, uh, it's extremely important that she is a on the board of trustees of Erlanger Medical System. So. We're really proud to have her and to have someone who is a historian of note, uh, especially about uh, the topic that she's going to address today. Uh, so we're going to turn it over at this point to Linda Moss Mines, um, noted Chattanooga, and uh, look forward to her talk. You want to turn the lights up, John? Oh, no, that's fine like that. I told Dr. Burns that I probably didn't need a microphone after having taught for 45 years, and he insisted that I have a microphone. And those of you that know Dr. Burns know that you just do what he tells you to do. It's just easier, always easier. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm going to sort of do a whirl around, and then I will come back as who I am today, if that's okay with you. I'm just really excited to be in Chattanooga today. You know, the last time that I was here was in 1865. And I must commend you on what I see that you've changed in Chattanooga. Now, it was a little difficult for me to get here because, quite frankly, we were, are within a couple of weeks of the 99th anniversary of my death. So it makes travel a little bit harder when you do that. But I want to tell you a little bit about my life and why I might have an interest in what goes on here at this hospital. I perhaps should introduce myself to you. I'm Mary Edwards Walker. I am a New York native, but you will notice that I spent many of my formative years as an early surgeon practicing in the South. So I adopted a wee bit of that Tennessee twang. I think you probably don't hear Oswego in my voice, even though that's my hometown. I need to let you know that how I came to be the first woman surgeon in the United States and the second doctor that was a female. And that's because I grew up in a rather 
absolutely amazing, wonderful family that our neighbors often sort of tagged us as being odd. In the South, people often seem to use the term when they talked about me as being quar. I don't really know what quar means, but they tell me that's a term that Southerners sometimes understand. Uh, my father and mother were firm believers and that there were no restrictions on what men or women alike could do. And as a result, by the age of seven, I was reading Greek. By the age of seven, I was reading Latin. And I must tell you that nothing excites me as much as doing geometry and a good calculus problem. You know, that was what we did at home for play. We would often sit around the fire and we would challenge each other with problems and see who could finish the problems quickest. And that person then got to choose the next problem that we as a family would solve. I'm sure your families did those, didn't they? <laughs> Calculus for the win, right? Maybe not. Um, in addition to that, because we were out on the frontier, my father had very strong believings about what was appropriate attire for women and that women should not be constricted by the social norms of that period of time. So I have to tell you that in deference to the fact that we do indeed have a mixed audience here, and some of you probably have very sensitive sensibilities, I would not want to upset anyone by showing too much ankle or anything. Quite frankly, I've never understood this whole thing about the ankles. I mean, I see several men right now, and I see their ankles. And you're really cute, but that does nothing for me. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. But my father believed that corsets in particular were harmful to the health of females because it tended to rearrange internal organs and made childbearing difficult. And as a result, many women died in childbirth. So we, growing up in us, we go, we wore trousers just like our two brothers, and we wore shirts. And that will have some impact on what happens later in my life. Now, when we finished our, our education at home, we were actually sent away to a girls' Suffolk Academy. And my sisters and I all graduated from there. And when we graduated, the expectation was that we would all become teachers. <laughs> I'm going to say this, and please don't judge me harshly, but small children are an awful lot like golden retriever puppies that have been untrained. They slobber, they potty, they twitch and everything. And I could not envision myself teaching children for the rest of my life. So I announced to the family that I was going to medical school in 1852. I was going to medical school, which apparently was not the norm. And I interviewed at the University of Syracuse. Anyone ever heard of Syracuse? Yeah, we've heard of Syracuse. So I interviewed, and, and the dean of the medical school, in his infinite wisdom, I'm sorry, are there any deans in the room? No. Said, I, I applaud your enthusiasm, but perhaps you really want to be a nurse. And I replied, according to the records, I applaud your wisdom, and no, I have no interest in being a nurse. I want to be a doctor, and not only that, I want to be a surgeon. He eventually agreed for me to matriculate to the University of Syracuse, having noted on my records that he gave me six weeks. And in six weeks, I would be flying home to my mother and her comforting arms. I graduated at the top of my class. I did find it very difficult after graduation, though, to find to found a practice and to find patients because for some reason, Women didn't go to the doctors very often. You know, women had their babies at home for the most part. You know, pop them, drop them, and go back to plowing. And men seemed to be uncomfortable with having a woman treat them. I never exactly understood that because they were not particularly uncomfortable treating women when there was a time of crisis. But again, you know, that was not appropriate for us. So I decided to move to the far west frontier, Cleveland, Ohio which was the frontier at that point in time. And I went there and established a practice and became somewhat successful, although I didn't have the impact that I thought I would have. You know, I thought people would beat their doors down, my doors down, to come and allow me to treat them, and that didn't happen exactly that way. Instead, after about a year, I received a letter from a fellow classmate, George Miller, who said, only in your absence have I realized how much I care. Would you come back and be my wife? And I thought, 
two doctors in one practice, we can divide up the patients. This sounds like a plan. <laughs> so I returned to New York, we married, and we moved to Rochester. And there we opened a practice, and we were very, very successful until I realized that my husband had misunderstood his calling. We had graduated from medical school, and apparently George, somewhere in the back of his mind, thought he had graduated from theology because he had developed a practice by which he was laying on of hands among many of our female patients. Ah, <laughs> oh, you laugh. I laugh too. And then I decided it would be better if I cut out of Rochester as opposed to cutting up George. It took me 10 years to get a divorce from that man. Unbelievable. What I did at that point is the storm clouds were, clouds were beginning to gather and I, being a good, astute uh, person who was interested in history and politics and the military, realized that the Civil War was coming. The storm clouds were there. Anyone who had remembered the Missouri Compromise, the Fugitive Slave Act, Kansas, Nebraska, Dred Scott, all those sorts of things knew that ultimately there was going to be a war to decide those paramount questions in our nation, our republic's history. So I decided that the best thing that I would do next is I would offer myself as a surgeon to the U.S. Army. I went to Washington. I visited headquarters and I announced, I am here, I am Mary Edwards Walker, I am a surgeon and I am here to join the Army. Well, that's pretty much the reaction I got is exactly what you're doing. There was sort of a blank stare on all of those military faces, at which point they said, we well, would be so much more beneficial if you would organize something that was sort of socially philanthropic here in the community. You know, perhaps you all could roll bandages. Roll bandages? I mean, not that rolling bandages isn't important, but I didn't think that was necessarily what I should be doing. But I did organize a group and we put together what it would be recognized today as a hospice center for those soldiers who had, were already on the front who came back so heavily wounded, could not be cared for at home and obviously were in their end of life situation. We did that. I organized a group of women who would write to those people on the front. We also organized a group of women who would lobby Congress and the President. Love Mr. Lincoln probably more than he may have loved me at some points in his career because I was somewhat persistent. You know, we have to be persistent, right, to get what we want done? You have to be persistent. Ultimately, when, when the war truly was at its height, beginning in the fall of, 80, of 61, after the battle at Fort Sumter, I presented myself then to the Union Army and said, hello, remember me? I'm Mary Edwards Walker. I'm a surgeon. I'd like to serve. And they offered me a position coming in as a nurse, which I refused. Eventually they came back and said, well, we will contract with you and then we'll judge your abilities. So I was present at Manassas one and Manassas two. I served at Gettysburg, but I really did not find myself until I came to the South. I arrived here in the summer of 1863 and began to organize things in this area. I don't know if you know the significance of Chattanooga in Civil War history. How many of you know your Civil War history in Chattanooga? Some of you do, good. Chattanooga, when, when Winfield Scott drew up the plans for how the Union was gonna win the war, one of those key elements was separate the Deep South. Separate the Deep South from the Northern South, separate the East from the West, and Chattanooga was identified in that initial plan as the gateway to the South. Why were we imported? For the same reasons we're still imported. We are special. But Chattanooga was important because every railroad that crossed the south eventually, there was an apex here, east, west, north, south. Mississippi River, Ohio Rivers, Cumberland Rivers, all of those flow into the Tennessee and if you control the Tennessee River, you controlled movement of troops, movement of supplies, all those sorts of things. So I get to Chattanooga and I'm here in time for the Battle of Chickamauga. All of you have heard of the Battle of Chickamauga? 25,000 casualties in three days of intense fighting in the hot September sun. That's where I really think I began to understand what the role of a battlefield surgeon was. You don't understand war. You don't understand carnage 
until you walk the battlefields in the late evening hours as the sun is setting and you hear the constant cries of boys wanting their mothers, Mama, 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 come find me. And it was at that point that I really understood that there was a reason why I had been chosen for this profession. Now, I have to tell you, I was not a Marianne Bakerdyke. I was not an angel of the battlefield. There are those within the surgical ranks that probably thought I was a demon on the battlefield because for two reasons, really. One, I challenged current procedures. And two, I treated both Union and Confederate soldiers, and I treated people who were living in the neighborhood. In fact, I see the descendants of one woman whose baby I delivered sitting back here in our audience as I pulled off of the Chickamauga battlefield through the woods into her ancestral house and delivered her ancestor in the middle of the Battle of Chickamauga. My mission was to go where I needed to be and do what I needed to do. So why was I controversial there? You know, we set our battlefield hospital up outside the actual battlefield. We were, as you enter Chickamauga Battlefield now, we would have been on the left toward Alexander Bridge. And we were treating, triaging and treating. And I came to con into conflict with the fellow surgeons with whom I was serving. It wasn't the level of skill that they exhibited necessarily, but it was the procedures in which we operated because it was an intense time, people are dying around us and everything, and they had adopted a policy that was chop, drop, and move, which meant that pretty much anyone who came into the hospital, if we deemed that they could be saved, the wound was too severe, it was going to take extra time, we simply chopped it, dropped it, and moved them on. One out of every two of those men who suffered from those amputations on battlefield site died within three days. Why did that happen? really hesitate to say that in front of this audience. Why, normally I can say that and people go, why? Well, for what we saw happening at Chickamauga in particular, something that happened at Manassas, at Cole Harbor, at Spotsylvania, and everywhere else is you brought someone in, you were going to amputate them, you got four orderlies, which actually meant you got four wounded who were not wounded so much that they couldn't hold someone down. If we had liquor, which we didn't have a lot of, could be that the officers drank a lot of it, but we didn't have liquor and certainly we didn't have anesthesia, so you held those wounded down. You gave them a leather strap and you sawed that limb off and while you were sawing, you had your trenching tool in the campfire until it turned red hot, the metal did, and then you slapped that trenching tool to the stub to cauterize the wound so that they wouldn't bleed to death. About one out of every five men died at that point because of the shock that their bodies went into one out of two of those who survived would, would succumb within three days. And so I questioned that. And it wasn't really that I questioned it so much as a medical procedure. I understood that time was of the urgence, that we had a limited amount of time, but I was a farm girl. I knew that when the war was over, those boys were going to go home. And let me tell you, they were, they were boys. The youngest person who fought at Chickamauga, 11 years old. I don't let my 11-year-old grandson out in town by himself, much less on a battlefield. They were going to go home, and if they were minus an arm or a leg, how were they going to provide for their families? How were you going to farm that way? How were you going to work the railroads? How were you going to do anything to care for your families? And the notations that I have from the Battle of Chickamauga in them, I deplore the fact that we are creating so many cripples. That was the common word at that point. But you can see my anguish when I saw that happening. So, Battle of Chickamauga, who won, who won that battle? South. South, yes. If you can say that you win a battle in which 25,000 casualties occur in three days. So, General Bragg, in charge of the Confederacy, you didn't know you were going to get to learn a little bit that I had to learn as a surgeon. General Bragg in charge of the Confederates, Rosencrans in charge of the Union, Rosencrans withdraws to Chattanooga because it's such a critical site. We're sitting here in this hole surrounded by mountains. This, one, this is a wonderful place to be strategically located. We could have been defeated. The Union could have been defeated very, very easily. Anyone in here related to General Bragg? Okay, good, because I'm about to say General Bragg never met an opportunity that he didn't miss. 
because instead of pursuing the Union into Chattanooga, he sits around literally for about six weeks planning his next attack, which allowed General Grant time to get here from the West, allowed Grant to bring Sherman from the West, allowed for them to bring up troops from Corinth from Mississippi, which had been a follow-up to Shiloh, and by the time Bragg decided to attack, it wasn't going to happen. It doesn't mean that it wasn't long and it wasn't bloody, but it's November when it happens here. And I'm still here. In fact, I could almost go upstairs. In fact, I could go upstairs and look and see where my field hospital was here. I was at the foot of a place called Cameron Hill, and it doesn't look like much of a hill anymore. <laughs> but in my days, that was a hill. And we would, uh, we would work on the soldiers there in that field hospital. It was a little lean-to. I can't really credit it with having been a building, quite frankly. But it was a lean-to. And we often triaged them in the church that was St. Paul's Episcopal. That served as a, a place for us to sort of decide who was going where into what hospital. I served there for that length of time. And it was a very controversial time. And in fact, there were often we didn't have the supplies that we needed. So I had asked for an audience with Sherman, went to meet Sherman, explained to him the needs, the urgency, what we had to get done. And I got it done. He did at some point in the middle of it say, excuse me, who are you? I had forgotten to, to tell him who I was. And I suppose that I looked a little different because I must tell you that while I wore this to meet you today because it's proper attire, this is not how I dressed for the battlefield. I dressed in trousers, an evening coat, and a top hat. I figured word would spread that there was a crazy woman on the battlefield in a top hat and neither side would shoot me because I didn't look like a soldier if I wore my top hat. And that's what I wore all the time. Now, Sherman later said that I had more tongue than an entire battalion of men and that I had whipped him thoroughly with it. It must have worked out okay, though, because it was General Sherman and General Thomas who jointly recommended me for the Medal of Honor. And that's what I'm most happy about standing here today before you is that not only was I the first woman surgeon, that in itself would be incredible. Not only did I learn from the men I served along, I hope I taught them a few things too. But more importantly, I served my nation. I served those boys. I made a difference, I like to believe, and I did it at a relatively early age. I am the only female ever to have been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. But the story doesn't really stop there, and I'm going to take just a couple more minutes and tell you a little bit more about my life and some of the things that happened so that hopefully when you leave here today and someone says, have you ever heard of Mary Edward Walker? You'll say, not only have I heard of her, I met her. <laughs> and she told me her story, and she went on and on and on and on and on telling us her story. Um, General Sherman and Thomas did indeed recommend for me for the Medal of Honor which was unheard of at that. The Medal of Honor, you may know, the first Medal of Honors were given for combat here in the Chattanooga area, and it was given to members of Andrews Raiders. If you get bored this afternoon, after the meeting, swing out by the Chattanooga National Cemetery, and as you enter the gates, you will see the small locomotive up on the pedestal, and you will see five Medal of Honor recipients buried in that circle. Others are buried in their home sta states and hometowns. The first Medal of Honor was awarded here in Chattanooga. The Medal of Honor as we know it today was designed by a Tennessean who himself earned the Medal of Honor during the American Civil War. The Medal of Honor was established then to recognize extraordinary bravery and courage on the battlefield far beyond human expectation. I was just a surgeon. But I like to think that in some ways what I did was just a small portion of what Desmond Doss would do to such a perfection years later as a conscientious objector and a medic working in the South Pacific and eventually earning the Medal of Honor. Now, President Lincoln is the one who wrote me the letter congratulating me and invited me to the White House. I was to arrive on April the 6th. But things went sort of crazy April the, in April of 1865. If you will remember, Lee surrenders to Grant at Affomattox. 
and my beloved president was failed by an assassin's bullet. So it was Tennessee and Andrew Johnson who presented my Medal of Honor to me. He pinned it on my chest, and from that day until the day I died, I wore it every day of my life because for me it was the highest honor that could be given to me. Now, I, w I was involved in a number of other movements that I'll throw out there real quickly. I was part of the group that believed that women should have the right to vote because certainly we knew as much about politics. Maybe we didn't know some of the uh, subterfuge, but some of the medical things that had been released earlier that said if women trouble themselves with, with ideas about politics and governments, their brains will implode and will drain out their nose and ears. <laughs> I sort of knew as a doctor that that wasn't going to happen, or I had not seen that happen. So that was not a good argument. I, however, did not support the 19th Amendment. I didn't believe the Constitution needed to be amended. I believed from the moment that Thomas Jefferson penned the Declaration of Independence and said, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are... Yes! Yes, you cannot forget that. If we forget, it, it leaves that our Constitution was written in the same vein and that all we needed was a Supreme Court who would actually interpret the Constitution the way that it was meant to be written. Did the Founding Fathers think about women? Did they think about people of color? No, they didn't, but they should have. And that could be corrected if the Supreme Court would just do it right. The other thing I was involved in was the women's clothing reform movement because <laughs> you can just sort of see that as a natural. It made no sense to me. One of the things that I had observed as a doctor was how many women died because their skirts got in the fire as they cooked at the fireplace, as they did laundry over an open fire with an iron kettle. And that seemed to me to be the most impractical thing in the world. In fact, I felt so strongly about it that at my wedding, I wore my wedding dress, two-piece, and the minute that we said, I do, I dropped my skirt and danced in my trousers. <laughs> May have been the beginning of a bad end. Uh, I also, by the way, did not take my husband's name, nor, and I did indeed have the Lutheran minister strike out obey as a part of the <coughs> vows. I suppose I was a rather difficult person and a bit ahead of my time. Now, what I do want you to remember is that my life was certainly not always easy. I was always out there sort of on the line pushing, 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 because the state of this republic was most important to me. If we do not guard the republic, the republic will die. Repeat that after me. We, if we do not guard the republic, the republic will die. You all are pitiful. <laughs> Absolutely pitiful. You can do that better. Go home and practice in the mirror. When I was 85 years old, I received a letter from President Woodrow Wilson. I'm gathering my thoughts so that I say nothing that is inappropriate for a woman of my statute. Asking me to return my Medal of Honor because as as I had gone in originally as a contract surgeon, he did not deem me to be worthy of a Medal of Honor because of battlefield heroics. I sent his letter back to him with my note at the bottom that said, I will wear my Medal of Honor until you snatch it from my cold, dead body. And I never gave it back. I died 18 months later, and at my funeral, you will be glad to know that men who were descendants of the men with whom I had served stood as the honor guard around my casket to make certain nobody snatched that medal, my personal medal. My official medal is now in the Historical Society of New York's vaults and is occasionally on display. But I was buried with that medal as I had certainly intended to be. My descendants, my daughter's children, launched a campaign in the 1970s to have me officially restored as a Medal of Honor recipient. And I must tell you that it was another Southerner who had read the records, knew what had happened at Chickamauga, at Chattanooga, at Bull Run or Manassas, and he signed, he put his pen to the proclamation that restored my medal with full honor, and that was Jimmy Carter. So today I stand before you again as the only female to have been awarded a Medal of Honor. And I thank you for having been here and for having listened just a little bit to my story about how going from farm girl to medical school to surgeon to battlefield surgeon to the Medal of Honor 
I want you to remember when you leave that no one wakes up in combat and says, I think I'll try and earn the Medal of Honor today. It doesn't happen that way. Ordinary people do extraordinary things because they believe that they can make a difference. That's important whether you're in the classroom, whether you're in the operating room, or whether you're sitting at dinner modeling behavior for your children and your grandchildren. We are a republic, which means we are not a democracy. We are entrusted with a republic that will only survive with active, engaged citizens. I'm dead. I can't change things. It is for you. What is it that my president said? It is for you, the living to take, go read your Gettysburg Address. Lincoln knew profoundly what would be needed for the Union to survive. I simply thank you for allowing me to be a part of it and wish you Godspeed as you make the world better every day here at Earl Anchor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the doctors Eastman, who wants to go first? Thank you very much. Uh, I must say that's a preamble for the lecture that I am going to give tomorrow. And all I'm going to say is that I have a special insight to women in surgery, and I'm going to allow my physician wife, who's not a surgeon, but she'll tell you why she has a special insight, to describe that. All I want to say is that I listened to your lecture, being a trauma surgeon, and about the wounds of battle, whether it's the Civil War or Korea or Vietnam or Iraq and Afghanistan today. Tomorrow, I will conclude my lecture with a statement given to me by General Rubenstein in Landstuhl, Germany in 2007 when I was a visiting professor there. And most of our operations, in fact, were amputations as a result of improvised uh, explosive devices. Most of those wounded warriors had one, two, or three amputated extremities. General Rubenstein came over from Heidelberg to visit me and said, Brent, this is the quote that I have above my desk in Heidelberg as a Brigadier General of the United States Army. And I think it says something about what you said today. And it was, the only victor in war is medicine. Most of what we know as trauma surgeons, we've learned from war, unfortunately. but. To women in surgery, I can't think of anybody who could speak to this better than my wife, Sarita, who I know as Tika, who wrote her surgeon mother's biography, and she'll tell you that. Well, Linda, thank you. That was, that was really wonderful. And as a historian and a woman interested in, in women in surgery, I, I loved it. Uh, the other thing that uh, war does sometimes is allow women to become surgeons, and that was the case for my own mother. What Brent didn't tell you was that um, he, his first surgical partner was his mother-in-law, which so far has be, been a unique uh, thing that he has never found anybody else to stand up and say when he talks about that um, in his various lectures. My mother was a little girl in Costa Rica, um, born in 1916, at a time when there was no higher education for women in Costa Rica, uh, which I will just say as an aside, since I'm very fond of that little country and since it has very, very high nearly universal literacy, uh, the government, with its small resources, decided that they would eliminate the university level 
so that they could use their money to give everybody a basic education, which was great for the country in general, but not good for, ex for exceptionally bright little girls. And so my mother decided at a very early age to become a physician in a country which didn't have a medical school and was then brought to the United States by her very uh, devoted mother, which sounds a lot like uh, Mary Walker's mother and father, who said if she needs to become a doctor, well, she can't stay here. She has to come to the United States. And she did. She was educated in the United States from the age of five. She went to Long Island College of Medicine, and she became a physician. But interestingly, even though New York, one might have thought, was a very advanced sort of a place, when she finished um, medical school in 1940, there was only one place where a woman could get resident training in New York anywhere, and that was the New York Infirmary for Women and Children. And my mother had decided by that time that she wanted to be a surgeon. So she went to New York Infirmary, where she could do a gynecological residency, because that was considered suitable. And so when war broke out in 1941, she was given an opportunity similar to that of of Mary Walker because all of a sudden all of the male residents went to war. And so then uh, the, the deans uh, and the directors of the medical colleges or the uh, hospitals had to look around for women residents. She happened to be one of two women who had enough surgical training that they were considered to be suitable to go to Memorial Hospital for cancer which was be ultimately became Sloan Kettering. So she and her friend then became the first women trained in surgical oncology in the United States because of war. War gave her that opportunity, just like Rosie the Riveter and just like the girls who played Major League Baseball. It gave that opportunity to a young, a young woman to become a surgeon. So she became a surgeon. She uh, also married. She had nine children. She, she uh, did a lot of uh, regulating of work-life balance, but she never quit operating. And then she considered to be the pinnacle of her career that her son-in-law came down to be her surgical partner. So she was a terrific lady. And I want to just say that um, since writing her biography, I uh, was asked to translate the... Uh, the biography from the Spanish of her first cousin. So there were these two fascinating young women in, what, in Costa Rica at the turn of the last century. And thinking about the fight for women's suffrage that Mary Walker also got into in the United States, which we finally won in 1920, uh, the, the struggle was just beginning in Costa Rica. So they were enlightened in many ways, but not about women. So the whole business about their brains coming out their noses, all of those arguments were used again. So I just finished translating that uh, biography of my mother's first cousin, who became the first woman attorney in all of Central America and, and ultimately the first woman ambassador to the Organization of American States. So there were a couple of bright little girls in that family. Anyway, thank you. I, I found that tremendously inspiring and it's lovely to hear about a woman like that. Other, other folks wanna ask a question or, or make a comment? We've, uh, yes, Bob, Robert. I've got a comment. Um, and first of all, I want to thank you for pointing out that we are a democratic republic and not a democracy. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's one person in a hundred in this country that understands that. So thank you. Um, I've read in more than one uh, source that during World War II, there was such a demand for physicians that the medical school curriculum was shortened from 48 to 36 months. And if we could do it in three years in World War II, why can't we do that now? I 
Well, I, I think that uh, having been someone who did that in 36 months, uh, for people, again, history, that is true. That's what happened in World War II, and most medical schools in the country did it. And when World War II ended, they all went back to four years, like Vanderbilt and Emory and places. The University of Tennessee kept right on going 36 months because we needed physicians in Tennessee. And so we continued that until 1972, when because of a political argument about funding for medical school, the chancellor of the medical school decided to play Russian roulette with the legislature, and the legislature won and said, okay, we're not gonna give you more money, and you've threatened to go to four years, so go to four years. So we've done that, and it can be done. Uh, and I, you know, I think my, my colleagues have all been pretty resilient. When Korea came along as a result of that, the University of Tennessee was in line and blowing and going, and so that's why there's so many advanced officers in the military who went to the University of Tennessee to medical school uh, because they were already primed and ready to put them on the field. So it can be done. You just have to design your curriculum accordingly. I don't know, somebody else may want to comment. Dr. Dr. Shack. Our, yes, our Linda, that was, one, that was wonderful. And uh, just to show you that things haven't changed all that much, and I'm, I guess I'm dating myself a little bit, but when I was a resident in surgery at Vanderbilt, there was only one female resident in our group of about 50. And when we'd make rounds, <clears throat> the patients would tap Sally. Her name was Sally Sherrod, became Sally Mattingly, and became a professor of uh, surgery at the University of Kentucky. Uh, say, nurse, can you say after the doctor's leave, <laughs> I want to ask you a question. <laughs> so we bought her a T-shirt that said, I am a doctor. Well, this has been, uh, anyone else want to make a comment? Yes, oh yeah, here we go. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Mary Edwards Walker. So it's not every day that we get to time travel and see what things were like in Chattanooga before we existed, but you have done that today. And so my question is, now that you have arrived in modern day Chattanooga, are there things that you are pleasantly surprised about, the way we do things, particularly in medicine, but politics too? And is there anything that disappoints you? Um, I think what I'm most amazed about are the, the wealth of opportunities available to everyone, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless in some cases of financial situations of families, the fact that we realize that there, that we may be born in different circumstances but not necessarily gifted differently and that those opportunities exist. Um, I do find it interesting that you find still that education is dominated primarily by women, that medicine is, is looking more equitable. Um, and I, I think one of my observations, and this is going to sound like a political ploy and it's not at all, is that I am in particular struck by the fact that this hospital is the age that it is, the medical system, and that we still continue to be the leading provider, that we have those outreach places where we are making a difference in communities, we're saving lives. You know, we are so integral in this community for so few people to know the true story of how important Erlanger is. And I, I say that not really not just as a board member, but as someone who's been, you know, a, a patient who has been involved in other aspects. And I don't know how we change that. What I am most proud of is that we serve everyone at their point of need and that there are no qualifiers for whom we are willing to do exactly what Mary Walker did on the battlefield, and that is, you need me, I'm there. And we do that, and we don't hear that often enough in the community. Without an Erlanger, this city would look different. It would look very differently. We don't have as many women in elected positions, um, and I have to be honest and tell you, I'm not one of those people that say we need to elect women because we need to elect women. I think that's probably as foolish as not electing women because we don't elect women. But I do love that we are becoming perhaps healthier 
and getting women involved in politics, if we could just teach everyone to speak civilly to each other, I would be ecstatically happy. We cannot reason together and save the republic if we cannot reason together. And that's local. Everything is local first. So, yeah. Okay. And I probably need to hush. <laughs> no, you know, uh, Linda, we will, I want to present you with something that you may have, and if you do, then you'll now have two. But it's uh, the have. Baroness Collection, the history of Erlanger Medical Center up to 1991. And uh, I particularly, we don't give these away very often. We have very few of them left, as a matter of fact. It was a limited printing. I still do have some, but they're under lock and key, believe me, uh, Julie. Uh, but we do give them to special people at special times. And this is one of those because she and I had a brief discussion beforehand. We want her to take up the gauntlet in addition to being a board of trustees member and come up with a history. Uh, come up with uh, 1991 going forward, uh, and you, as a member of the board here, are part of that history. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very for much. Great job. Thank, you. thank you, everyone, for coming. Appreciate it very much.